everyday injustice. Too many wrongful convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Today on Everyday Injustice, we have Amika Moda. She's the executive director of Sister Warriors Freedom Coalition. Welcome to our show. Thanks for having me, David. I appreciate it. So um, tell us um, about the Sister Warriors Freedom Coalition. Yeah. The Sister Warriors Freedom Coalition is a coalition of currently and formerly incarcerated women, girls, and trans folks of all genders. Um, we have about 6,000 members across the state of California. About 1,000 of those members are currently incarcerated. Um, and we, we, we were born in 2017 at a convening in Oakland. Uh, there's hundreds of us that gathered from across the country and we were there to really kind of hash out our um, political agenda for the next 10 years and also to really talk around what it was in particular that criminalized women and girls. Um, so we started in this kind of huddle um, and then in an event determining policy priorities and that original convening was so magical. We were like, we can't just convene like this. We need to create ongoing space um, where people can gather that have experienced similar things and trajectories and are working to change those. So uh, that's a little bit of our origin story, but also to say that we came um, out of the Young Women's Freedom Center, which has been around for 30 years and the methodology of the center. And so they are based out of the headquarters is in San Francisco. We're now at five sites across the state, um, but an, also an organization that has served over 30,000 women and girls and trans folks over the years. Um, so yeah, so that is a sister organization that we um, you know, share methodology with, and we kind of feel like the big sisters to the Young Women's Freedom Center <laughs> in a lot of ways. And how did you get into this space? Mm -hmm, great question. So I actually came home from prison myself 10 years ago uh, in 2015, and the Young Women's Freedom Center was the first job uh, that I got uh, coming home. And I was actually a bit of a participant at the time. I was, you know, figuring out reentry for myself um, and reuniting with my family, my children, and the Young Women's Freedom Center um, really just kind of swooped me up and supported me through that time like they have for so many others that are re-entering. Um, and I've been part of that ecosystem for the last 10 years. Um, and yeah, so that's how I stepped into the work. And I like to say that, you know, it was a job at the beginning and it became um, a political home for me and also just a space where I was allowed to have the time and space that I needed to figure things out when I was coming back um, with a lot of other people that had experienced things similar to me. So our main topic today is going to be heat protection for incarcerated people in California. And I, I want to uh, start out by saying, you know, we, we started saying this up like a month, month and a half ago, and we're recording this in early September. And so uh, we we're kind of getting past another heat wave, at least where I am. Uh, but, you know, what, what's really interesting to me, I think, is that one of the things that we're we're starting to see, and I live in, in Davis near Sacramento, and we set a record this year for several bad categories, right? Like uh, it was over 110 degrees for five straight days where I live, uh, which uh, has never happened. In fact, um, in recorded history, 110 of uh, five days is like a record for uh, a year. Um, and we did it in five days. Um, and we set a record in July for most days over 100. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think you and I will agree that things are only going to get worse because the, the world is heating up and we're not doing nearly enough to stop it. I think what most people don't think about 
uh, when they think about extreme heat is the effect on incarcerated people. Um, they may think about, you know, farm workers and people that are out in the sun, but uh, incarcerated people kind of get forgotten. And California might be a little bit better than some other states where they don't even have air conditioning, but it's still a problem in California. So, so what's been happening on that front? Yeah. I mean, I think that um, just yes to everything you said, like we are not on a path where um, the weather is going to shift and conditions are going to kind of uh, normalize in prisons. We know we're on a trajectory of hotter days, um, increased fires, um, increased kind of conditions that our incarcerated loved ones are going to be enduring. Um, and so, you know, there's been so much going on in there. For one, I think anybody that has spent time within those institutions just understand the conditions that exist on the inside. Um, so although, you know, I'm sitting right now in an air conditioned space um, and able to kind of um, have some relief from how hot it, it has been outside, um, we don't have air conditioning at the women's institutions in California. So um, there is a kind of swamp cooler mechanism for the majority of housing units and also like common areas for folks. In my understanding, the air conditioning is reserved for the administrative spaces and the staff that kind of work in the prisons, right? Not the people who live inside of the prisons. Um, and as somebody that spent seven years inside of those institutions myself, I know very well what it's like when you're enduring this, this, this type of heat that folks um, have been experiencing. So just to give a little bit of a picture of what it looks like on a hot day inside, um, in Chowchilla, which is located in the Central Valley, and probably David has maybe hit records that exceeded Davis's, right? Like, well, we, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm like, you know, like 110 is like, eh, I don't know, maybe 118 is when we start calling it hot there. But, you know, it's really, it's intense, it's intense heat in Chowchilla in the Central Valley, and also in Chino, where the other women's designated facility is. Um, and, you know, there's, Chachilla is an example of there are eight people in a cell at a time together, and there are no fans, there are no windows that open. The only fans that people have access to are if you have the resources to buy a fan from a catalog in your quarterly package, right? And those cost between 30 and $45, which is, like, on average, what somebody earns in a month if you have a if you're lucky enough to have a job right um so you know any personal type of fan that would be in your cell that could cool you down is something that you would have to purchase and the other kind of fans that are in common areas um you know it's these large fans but not a lot of people get access to that cooling if you do you have to go kind of huddle in a common area and share with many others um Plus a fan doesn't really do much if it's a hundred degrees. <laughs> Does not do much. Absolutely. And like that swamp cooler. Yeah. Great. It's a great concept. And at that level of heat, it's just like not doing what it needs to do. Right. Um, so people have been enduring these really extreme conditions as things get hotter. Um, you know, unfortunately we had someone that passed recently at CCWF, um, Adrian, and, you know, people, um, advocates outside have really organized um, and come together around the circumstances of her death, but also how many other people are exposed to these conditions that have, you know, underlying health conditions or, um, you know, so I think people are really afraid for our folks on the inside that are experiencing this type of heat with not a whole lot of relief. Um, and then I also think that, you know, the, you know, what we know is set in place by CDCR, which is, you know, after it hits a certain degree, they're required to put these like um, buckets of ice outside, not buckets, they're um, in ice water. 
but we all know like that ice water is gone in the first 10 minutes it's put out there right everybody gets a little cup you get a little taste of some ice water it's not like you have a continual access to ice or cooling mechanisms um so I, I just think that we are really well aware that like that what what is in place to um, counter these hot days it's just not enough to keep our folks safe, um, cool, and you know for the first time this year we actually saw Chowchilla allow in cooling cloths. It's the first time we've ever seen them do that, and that's just a you know a cloth you put around your neck. Um, that you can kind of squeeze in cold water and keep your body a little bit cooler. Um, but yeah, people are, are facing these extreme conditions. And I, I would say even more so than just the heat, you know, we, uh, in the middle of these kind of fire seasons, we also saw in the last few years, you know, fire approaching um, prisons without much of a plan to kind of evacuate folks or pe keep people safe um, in the middle of these uh, kind of natural disaster um, moments. And so we also feel really scared for our folks because we know that the plans in place are not good enough to uh, protect our folks, evacuate them for facilities that are um, facing fires, floods, uh, things like that. A lot to unpack there. Um, and and I feel like it, it's really important to make make it clear that you know, this is not just a comfort issue. This is a safety issue. Yes. Um, you know, people are kind of skeptical. Oh, well, you know, people in prison really shouldn't be comfortable. And yeah. I, I would kind of dispute that. But yeah. leaving that point aside, um, you know, what we're really talking about is life threatening heat yeah. um, that people are trapped in places where they can't get out. Um, and you know, we're spending billions of dollars a year to incarcerate people and we can't pay for adequate uh, cooling uh, systems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, when, one of the jobs I held when I was incarcerated um, was a, as an incarcerated firefighter um, at CCWF the last two and a half years of my time there. Um, I was a firefighter for both the institution and also our surrounding um, county. We had a mutual aid agreement with Madeira County. And one of the things that I, you know, accessed as a firefighter there was um, these kind of trainings for, um, you know, incident command response for in case of a hazmat incident, a fire, a flood, right? we would do these types of trainings to prepare. And what became really clear to me in that training um, was that there was not much of a plan for incarcerated people. There was a plan to evacuate staff, but when it came down to incarcerated people, the grandest plan was shelter in place. And there, it used to be a joke and people would laugh about it, but you know, the fire chiefs and captains would laugh and say, you know, when the buses are coming, they're coming for staff, but like y'all are on your own. Um, you know, they said that in a joking manner, but that was really about it. I mean, there was no other plan that we ever actually saw um, from CDCR except this shelter in place, um, which we know is basically in so many cases, um, sentencing people to death, right? And, um, you know, I think that one of the things I brought up around these kind of underlying conditions that actually really do, um, it's not about comfort when it comes to heat, it very much is around um, people need to be safe and figure out how to um, navigate this heat. There are just are so many folks inside that, um, that, have different types of illnesses, different, you know, and, and it, this is very much a safety issue. It's so clear. Um, it's not about comfort. This is about life. Um, this is about, you know, we have a lot of elders um, inside of prison um, that do not have any more access than any of the young folks coming in to better conditions. Um, so yeah, just 100% agree with you on the 
I, that this is really much about health and not about uh, comfort. And, you know, there are also multiple levels to the fire issue. Um, so there's the physical threat to the facility, which I think is a, a, a reasonable concern. Um, but there's also, you know, and I remember, you know, uh, a few years ago, we haven't had it this year, but uh, uh, we would have two or three weeks at a time where we were just completely smoked in like you know you'd walk around and there'd be this red haze and sometimes you wouldn't see the sun and there'd be ashes uh falling from the sky um and you know for a normal person a healthy person that that has normal lungs you know it's an annoyance but for like my wife who has asthma it, it's a serious threat like you know um and so are are there precautions in place for incarcerated people that are have sensitive lungs hmm. that's such a great question um there are none that i'm aware of um i think that um we experience things similarly on inside versus outside. Like we know when you smell smoke or when there is a fire that's close enough to change um, the environment, like it's clear people will choose to stay inside more if they can. A lot of people don't have that choice. A lot of people that are working while incarcerated are working on the grounds, are working on the fire grounds, are working, right? Like, and so, um, Typically, uh, you know, work is not halted uh, because of uh, the air quality, for sure. Um, and I would also add to that the um, extreme circumstances that incarcerated people that are in these jobs as firefighters are facing. And so although we tend to get this kind of um, drift sometimes of smoke from close fires, um, a lot of incarcerated people are the front lines um, for a lot of these fires and are so um, the kind of health risk is really, really compounded. And we're up close and personal breathing in that smoke um, with nothing more than a bandana as protection for most incarcerated firefighters. Now to shift slightly here, um, do we have stats for heat related illnesses that are suffered by incarcerated people in California? Oh, I wish I could tell you that I have those stats in, easily accessible, but what I can absolutely point to is the Ella Baker Center report, His Hidden Hazards, which was recently released that talks a lot about um, heat-related illness and like all of the conditions that folks endure, but unfortunately I don't have that data. Fair enough. Um, and so, you know, what kinds of measures are in place to protect the population? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is these kind of heat alerts when um, you, you, we hit a certain degree in prison. I think it's at 105 degrees um, in the institutions. There is a heat alert that is um, set out. Um, some yard crews are brought in um, after a certain amount of hours of working in a certain temperature. Um, there are those uh, things that I brought up where ice is kind of put out on the yard. Now there have been some cooling cloths made available, but there is no plan to, um, you know, increase the actual um, daily kind of experience that people have of uh, their units, right? So there is not like, I mean, in my opinion, like everybody should have a personal fan in Chowchilla. I'm like, if I think about the budget of CDCR, um, it, it's just wild to me that that isn't something that is abs like absolutely provided to everybody in the middle of um, a heat wave. Um, and so, yeah, beyond those kind of heat alerts, um, some staff being brought in or some incarcerated staff being brought in, there's just not a whole lot that's going on um, to make sure our folks are okay. So, and this is going to sound like an understatement, but, uh, you know, 
Um, it, it seems like this is a big inadequacy in, in the system. And so is this an area that, that you guys are pushing on? Yeah, I mean, I think that we have that complex dynamic of um, thinking about the conditions our folks are experiencing um, and also not wanting to continue to invest in the infrastructure of prisons, right? Right. It's, it's this very, it's a complex situation, right? So um, although we 100% want to see conditions improve, um, we do not want to see more money funneled to CDCR um, you know, to kind of improve the prisons that we have. Like we, as particularly in the women's prisons, um, you know, I actually think that we are much closer. Um, I mean, I think the idea of decarceration feels more important than ever in these types of conversations, right? Because we have, I think it's something like 3,500 women left in those two institutions, right? Like that is actually um, something where we could viably talk about what decarceration looks like rather than, um, you know, kind of bulking up these two institutions with um, a whole lot more money um, when we could be kind of spending those in other ways. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a dynamic. Like we, we want our folks to be okay. Um, so I think we always let currently incarcerated people speak first on that, right? Like what they want to see. Um, and I can tell you, we've had that we've seen some really creative ideas coming out of the inside. Um, we have, they've, you know, a lot of the girls that we were talking to last time we were in, we're talking about these, um, these kind of like ice units that go into swamp coolers. And so they, I mean, they're coming up with all sorts of ideas, like, you know, with this existing infrastructure, we could do this. Right. And so, um, it's uh, always like blows our mind to see the kind of brilliance that's coming from the inside um, and hoping that that would translate to administration at CDCR. Um, so yeah, I think we um, are never quite sure how we handle that piece, um, but we know that like fans, air conditioning, all of those things are really kind of basic to keep people safe. Um, and so, yeah, we hope to see conditions improve. Right. And, you know, I, I do want to address that uh, part of that point, because I agree with you. It's kind of like, um, you know, trying to a a address working conditions for slaves mm -hmm. um, when you really want to focus on abolition. Yep. Um, you know, on the other hand, I think, you know, this is another argument for rethinking what the carceral system looks like and how large that system is. Because, you know, from my experience, and I'm sure you would agree, a, a good percentage of the people that are incarcerated don't need to be at this point. And, and so if we could deal with that end of it, it'd make it much easier to have things like cooling systems in yeah. place because you wouldn't be spending billions upon billions of dollars every year. That's right. A hundred percent. I mean, I think that's really it. You know, like we are so clear that um, we have so many elders incarcerated in prison, right? That are just not uh, a threat to public safety. And the idea that we cannot like just really buckle down on focusing on these populations that we can safely um, release but that every year we're having to talk about these horrific conditions, right? It's like there, so yeah, we, we definitely hold that dynamic. Um, and also we're thinking about creative ways that we get to work within what is right now. Um, and so, you know, a call for really these kind of either air conditioning in the units, fan, more access to ice, more access to water, um, better, better health care inside so that folks that are actually experiencing um, heat, stroke, exhaustion um, are seen, acknowledged, believed. That's another problem is that a lot of times when people are alerting staff about how they feel, they're, they're often not believed or, you know, said to be exaggerating, things like that. Unfortunately, we saw 
something very similar like that happened with Adrian before she passed, right? You know, she had been telling folks, um, you know, her cellies had been telling people um, and she just wasn't, you know, tended to um, in the way that she should have been. So yeah, that it's definitely a dynamic that um, we're dealing with as well. And, and I think, you know, you mentioned elders in the prison and also, you know, people with physical disabilities, um, you know, those are the very people that, uh, you know, we really need to th rethink incarceration for anyway. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about Adrienne and her story? Yeah, I mean, I, in some ways, I, um, I will do my best to lift her in the, in the ways I do feel like there are others that um, I wish could be the one telling her story. Um, but what we understand about Adrienne is that she was somebody that also was dealing with, um, you know, kind of pre-existing health conditions and that she um, was really clearly affected by the heat. It had been actually a couple of days of her telling folks that she wasn't feeling well um, leading up to her death. And so um, what we've kind of heard is that she had, you know, she really let people know she actually reached out to medical um, and that her uh, cries for help were kind of dismissed initially. Um, and yeah, and so she she passed a CCWP, which is California Coalition for Women's Prisoners and many other um, advocates and organizations have really kind of swooped in to hold up Adrian and also to advocate on her behalf. Um, there was a protest that happened at CCWF, um, you know, shortly after Adrian passed. I mean, people were just devastated, right? That it that it came to this, um, that yet again, an incarcerated woman's cries were ignored. Um, and really, I just think this has like activated so many advocates to, um, you know, demand that CDCR, well, they are in the process of touting, you know, Gavin Newsom's California model. Um, you know, there's all these talks about improving prisons and making them look nicer and this massive investment into San Quentin. Um, and yet we have these crises happening within the women's institutions that are often ignored. Um, including Adrian's death, right? I think it was very much dismissed as not necessarily heat related. Um, the stories really kind of conflict from what people on the ground with Adrian were saying and what CDCR administration says. Um, so yeah, I think that it is for most people that have lived inside those institutions, it wasn't a surprise um, that we lost yet another sister. Um, to this kind of inadequate medical care and often neglect um, of what people are experiencing. Um, but it was a tragedy and it has really kind of activated folks to really question um, what type of investment is CDCR putting into um, keeping people safe during these um, heat waves. And, you know, again, as we talk about the California model, how is that like rolling out? How is that, how is it that our folks are actually doing better inside these institutions um, rather than worse? And I, I'm gonna say a lot of people are not feeling super hopeful right now. Um, and I think we should add that, you know, this is kind of on top of the substandard healthcare that they're receiving yes. uh, while incarcerated. So there's all sorts of horror stories that we don't have time to get into today um but it's it's an important topic on its own because basically you know you have these these conditions in the prison and they're exacerbating all these other shortcomings including you know kind of this lack of i, I mean it's not just lack of health care right it, it's lack of care and attention yes. uh, to the health and safety of people that are incarcerated. I mean, you get all these horror stories of people that, you know, could have had um, life-threatening conditions diagnosed and prevented 
uh, had the system only taken the time to, to look into people's complaints. Instead, yeah. they kind of assume everybody's just whining. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, so many of these issues intersect in so many ways, right? When it's, we're talking about kind of climate justice, um, sexual assault, uh, you know, um, the healthcare systems within prisons, so many of these issues intersect. And, you know, just as a, an organization that works particularly with uh, women and trans people in, in prison, um, we also really see the way that, um, you know, gender is playing into the way that people are experiencing the institutions. Um, so yeah, so many issues that we don't have the time to dive more deeply into there, but I, want to like 100% agree with just the sentiment of more care needed, right? And, you know, that is something, Sister Warriors, um, you know, as people, most of our staff has lived inside of those institutions, right? And we, we don't have the solution for every issue that comes up, right? But what we know matters so much is the ability to come alongside our folks um, as they are experiencing incarceration, right? Because we, you know, people have been kicked out of the world and a lot of these institutions are placed in um, geographically areas that are really hard to get to. So we see like limited programming and, um, you know, it's a stretch for people to come visit, but it means everything to our folks inside um, to have people come alongside them that care um, and, you know, in, in more ways than just like advocating for their conditions, but also just um, inquiring into, you know, people's own, how, how folks are doing. Um, and yeah, so I just think that's, it's such a big piece of it. Um, it's just having others come alongside uh, people that are incarcerated and understand that, um, that there's a lot of issues that um, belong to all of us, right, um, as, as a public health issue. Well, Amika, um, I'll let you have the last word on that. Um, we're, we're out of time, but I really appreciate you coming on our show and, and sharing this very important issue um, and, and your perspective on it, because, you know, it's one thing to hear about these issues. It's another thing uh, to talk to somebody who's actually been in there and, and can articulate it. So thank you very much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for continuing to lift up these issues that we want everyone to be thinking about, um, not just our folks behind the walls, right? So. Amika Moda, she's the executive director of Sister Warriors Freedom Coalition. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more Tales from the Injustice System. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mouse Quake Barrett for the use of our opening, Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com.